Okay. Well, this is quite a coincidence because I'm also here to talk about a game about regenerative mushrooms that you can delete. Um, <laughs> it's not true at all. Um, so I'm, I'm Dan White. I'm from Filament Games. Um, if you uh, don't know who we are and you would like to, I'll assume that you can use the internet. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about a product that we built and released into the K-12 education market. Um, and naturally, the beginning of our process was market research. So this is the Horizon Report. Quick show of hands for who's familiar with the Horizon Report in the audience. Okay, some of you. So this is a, a report that prognosticates on education technology that's coming down the pike, and it talks about when it's going to happen. So game-based learning was in the Horizon Report from 2010 to 2012. It was in there for three years in a row, and for three years, the Horizon Report said game-based learning is going to come into its own, into mainstream, in two to three years. So for three years, it was going to happen in two to three years. That got awkward uh, toward the end. And so in 2013, game-based learning disappeared from the Horizon Report, and I haven't seen it since. Um, so not all the market research was in support of what we were trying to do, but of course everybody knows that market research is just parlance for, I went out and I found things to confirm my biases, and I'm going to do the thing that I would want to do anyway. So we forged ahead. And uh, we, we uh, decided to make a, a, middle school, a series of middle school life science games uh, because that's where nobody spends any money ever after they spend all their money on math and reading. Um, and uh, we started with uh, uh, basically the process of analyzing middle school science curriculum. And we said, what parts of these curriculum are going to make good game experiences? And so what I'm going to talk about from here on out is um, a few of those games and what went um, horribly awry, because from my perspective, that's what's most interesting. You're welcome to go play the games. I encourage you to. You can decide for yourself what you like and what you don't like about them. But I'm going to talk about things that didn't work out. So this is You Make Me Sick. This is a game about bacteria and viruses. Um, and the, the lesson here was be let, beware the shifting political winds, because shortly after we released You Make Me Sick, NGSS came onto the scene. Uh, NGSS said, you know what? Bacteria and viruses are passe. Actually, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't say that. They just excluded them altogether in the, in the, uh, uh, the curriculum. So that was an unpleasant surprise. Um, this is a game called Crazy Plant Shop, um, where you're breeding plants together in order to fulfill orders for customers. Um, this game had a similar challenge with this game uh, called Motion Force, where you're learning about Newtonian physics by piloting a spaceship around obstacles and saving adorable fuzzy creatures. Um, both of these games had solid core concepts that we explored uh, in a very deep way. So we drilled really deep on a very narrow set of learning objectives across about two to three hours of gameplay. Now in the consumer space, the more gameplay, generally the better. Consumers seem to lament when the game is short and they seem to um, love it when you waste as much of their time as possible. Um, in the education space, teachers uh, feel very differently about how you use their time. Um, and so there's this sort of what I like to call like the, the education coverage or content coverage to gameplay ratio. And um, I think for teachers, they'd like you to get in, cover as much as you can, as quickly as possible, and get the heck out of there. Um, so in this case, when we drilled very deep on a, on a narrow set of learning objectives across two to three hours, uh, I think a lot of teachers would tell you that it's not the ideal use of, of, of the classroom. This is a game called Cell Command, um, where you're learning about cells um, by manipulating their organelles. Um, the challenge with this game is that we just didn't like it very much, so we remade it. Um, well, we gave it, gave it a new coat of, point, new coat of paint. Um, even after that, I would still say this is probably one of the weaker games in the portfolio. The interesting thing, however, is that this is also one of the better selling games to teachers. So this prompts this question of, um, well, literacy, game literacy, and also just forces us to acknowledge that teachers may be evaluating the gameplay very differently than we do. <clears throat> and if you require further, evidence of this look no further than cool math. I'm sorry to do this to you, to make you look at this screenshot. Um, if you look at this, you might assume that their business model, <coughs> the way they make money is to show this to people and then ask for money in order to spare them from having to look at it any further. Um, but in fact, they make millions of dollars from ad revenue. There's so many people um, who come to the site to play these crappy math games, uh, they can sell millions of dollars worth of ad revenue. Now, the thing that I love about this, I don't know if my laser pointer will work, but if you look up toward the top there, it says, welcome to the new cool math. What in God's name did the old cool math look like? <laughs> That's a question. Okay. 
I digress. Um, this is a game um, that we actually killed all together. It's a game called Body Command, um, where you're learning about the body. So, so you, you play this secret agent, and you can uh, manipulate his organs in order to get him to accomplish uh, the mission. Um, and, and really, the lesson here was that sometimes things look great from a learning perspective on paper, don't work out so well in practice. In this particular case, you could succeed at the game um, with, without really understanding the learning objectives. So we actually remade this game uh, into a completely different game called Dr. Guts that I like quite a bit more. This is a game called Fossil Forensics, where you're looking at change over time by comparing similarities among fossils. Um, what we tried here is something called the Lean Methodology. Uh, basically, in two weeks, we built a minimum viable product, and we actually sold that. We actually sold the thing that we made in two weeks. We sold it on a moto, and we built in a feedback mechanism so that people could give us feedback with the idea that further development would be based on the feedback that we got from the user community. Um, the problem was we didn't get any feedback. Um, people did buy the game, but they never told us what they thought about it. Um, and so we, here we had a development team uh, ready to go, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for feedback that just never came in. So we now have a person, we now have a full-time person whose job it is to um, talk to teachers, talk to students, line up play tests so that we have this steady stream of feedback that can keep pace with the development teams. Um, his name is Marshall Berenger, and he's actually here at Games for Change. Uh, so his sole reason for existing at uh, is to, well, I mean, as a professional, he has many other, <laughs> many other valid reasons, but is to help us keep pace with the, um, the amount of feedback that we need. Um, Reach for the Sun. Uh, in this game, um, we tried something that we didn't try with any other games, and that is that we released it on Steam on a whim, um, just because um, Valve asked us to, and you kind of do what Valve asked you to do. Um, and the, in direct contrast to our experience um, with the Lean methodology and, and the Enmodo release, we got this outpouring of feedback from the Steam community. Um, it actually prompted us to add a strategy mode to the game that didn't exist when we first launched it. So I would recommend, even for somebody who's not um, trying to make a game for the consumer market, that they still release their game on Steam just for the feedback. It was amazing. Um, so um, we also developed curriculum materials around these games, and our thinking there was that Games um, are often considered apps by educators, and apps are considered to be cheap or free, or otherwise you know, stigmatized to be of low value. Curriculum, however, people pay very real dollars for, despite the fact that it costs a lot less to make curriculum than make the game. The curriculum, I think, is often perceived as being um, the more valuable part of the experience, at least in terms of the economic value. Um, so we make the curriculum, and with the idea that the, the product uh, as a collective will be perceived as being of higher value. And also curriculum are familiar to teachers, whereas you know, early adopters, games, great. Uh, early majority, maybe not so much, maybe it's a little scarier, whereas curriculum are more familiar. Um, TBD, um, whether or not the curriculum actually make that much of a difference. When we're at Expo showing this to teachers, a lot of them get really excited about the curriculum, some of them don't care at all. We also hired third-party researchers to evaluate the efficacy of the games, which we're now finding is extremely valuable when we're having district-level conversations. They have that box to check. They want to see what your data is. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we focused our, our efforts on institutional K-12 market. Um, we did this because it's, it's very easy. All you have to do is make a good game, get the word out, um, and whoops, I hit forward and there's more stuff. Um, you also have to do all, all these things. And oh my god, there's a second page of bullet points. I hope you're fast readers. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's, um, that's all. Oh, no, there's a third page <laughs> of bullet points. Uh, and there's actually a fourth page, too. Um, if anybody's actually interested in reading those or you couldn't take a picture, feel free to follow up with me afterwards. I'll give you my slides. Uh, we made a, uh, so the, another interesting thing was that the, the web delivery vehicle, the e-commerce solution, um, in, ended up being kind of a product in and of itself in order to satisfy all the needs of institutional buyers. Um, so we iterated on this just like we would a game. Here's the f that was the first instantiation. Here's the second instantiation. And then we actually did a third instantiation of the website. And uh, the real question is, why do we pivot the website so many times? And the answer is, all in the name of simplicity. So at one point, we had subscriptions. We nuked subscriptions. At one point, we had bundles. We nuked bundles. At one point, we had bulk level discounts. We nuked bulk level. So everything is like, let's get every potential obstacle out of the way that we can and make it dead simple for teachers to buy this stuff. We hired a marketing team, um, and initially it was a grassroots campaign. Um, we built a bunch of very attractive marketing materials, and we did a combination of expos and, um, and uh, uh, direct mail, so digital direct mail and also physical direct mail. Um, we spent a lot of money on that and learned that those things um, don't work very well. 
Now our marketing efforts are primarily focused on PR and SEM. Um, and then we also have a salesperson whose job it is to try to work the higher accounts, those district, district level accounts. Um, and the, the lesson for us there is that when we build relationships with, with educators and administrators, they usually end up buying. So educators, um, I think everybody buys based on trust, but I think it's especially true for educators. So when they know us and they, uh, they, can, they can reach out and strangle us if they need to, then they typically buy. Um, so the last thing I'll say is just the blue line there is a slow curve that we're on. It's a gradual build as opposed to what you might see in the consumer space, a quick spike in the beginning and then a, and then a very quick tail off. And now the big question is, can we build that line faster uh, than it costs us to maintain the customers that we already have and the cost of acquiring new customers? Um, I don't know what the answer to that is, but maybe I can tell you at Games for Change 2016. Thank you.